Okay, nomenclature of ionic compounds. This video is going to teach you how to write the names and formulas of ionic compounds. So the first thing to know about ionic compounds is that they consist of a cation and an anion. So when you see the T here in the cation, hopefully that can help you remember that cations are positive ions. Anions add negative ion, anions are negative ions. And so ionic compounds are made up of a cation and an anion. Now usually the metal is the cation. I would say 99% of the time the ionic compound has a metal um, as its cation, a metal ion, and the anion is going to be a non-metal ion. Now it may be a cluster of atoms in this non-metal ion, a cluster of non-metals in this ion, and so it may also be a polyatomic ion. So we'll look at specific examples of those. So generally ionic compounds then are going to be made of a metal and a non-metal. The metal ion comes first and then the non-metal ion is second. So this is a photograph of the periodic table that you have on your quizzes and tests. So we know that the staircase, the bold line over here that I'll just go over in red so you can see it, we know that the staircase separates the metals from the nonmetals. With the exception that hydrogen over here is actually a nonmetal. So all the metals on the left side of the staircase form positive ions, and the nonmetals on the right side of the staircase form negative ions. The noble gases, group 18, these elements are not involved in ionic bonding. They do not form negative ions. So what are the charges on these ions? Well, if you recall your Bohr-Rutherford diagrams of atoms, every atom in group one, so I'm looking over here at the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. All of these atoms of these elements have one valence electron, one electron in the outer shell. And to become stable, they will lose that one electron. Losing electrons is like losing, they're negatively charged, is like losing stress. You feel more positive. And so when electrons are lost, the particle becomes positively charged. There's actually more protons than electrons in that particle, and so we have extra positive charge. In the case of group one atoms, they lose one electron to become stable, and so they form a positive one charged ion. Group two, these atoms form uh, positive two charged ions. Group 13, it's really aluminum over here that, even though it's on the staircase, is not actually a metalloid, it's considered a metal. Um, aluminum will form positive three charges, um, positive three charge, losing three electrons. At the bottom of group 14, we have tin and lead. Tin and lead can form either positive two or positive four charge. You'll find that carbon and silicon are really involved in sharing electrons, and so they typically, we won't see those in our ionic compounds. In group 15, nitrogen, phosphorus, they have five valence electrons being in group 15, and now they're closer to being stable by just gaining three electrons. So to gain negative charge or to gain stress makes you feel worse. To gain electrons, the particles now have negative charges. Gaining three electrons, negative three is the charge. Now we have three more electrons than protons in that particle. In group 16, those particles have six valence electrons, so they gain two to become stable, and the halogens in group 17 gain one electron to become stable. So it's crucial that you know the charges for groups one, two, and all the ones that I filled in here on the right side of the periodic table. So we're going to use those when we, when we write formulas of ionic compounds. Okay, so let's look at binary ionic compounds. A binary ionic compound contains two elements. So we've already said ionic compounds are made of metals and nonmetals. So the first element will be a metal ion, and the, 
and the second particle will be a non-metal ion, so a metal-non-metal -metal combination. When we write formulas of ionic compounds, we use the cross-down method. So I've provided the steps for you here. You're going to write the symbols, so the symbol of the metal and the charge of the ion, the symbol of the non-metal and the charge of the ion. Then we're going to cross down those numbers, omitting the positive or negative signs, reduce those subscripts if possible, and then write our final answer. And if you do have a subscript of one, then you omit that. So you do not write the one in the final answer. So let's do these two examples using the part you can see of the periodic table here. So for the example number one, sodium oxide. So we first look at the periodic table and find the symbol for sodium. Sodium, if you'll recall, is Na, and you find that over here in group one. So we write the symbol Na and then the charge. So sodium with a positive one charge. And then we look for oxide. Now I realize oxide isn't specifically on the periodic table, oxygen is. And the reason you're seeing that IDE ending is because when oxygen forms a negative ion, we name the ion oxide. So that IDE ending is telling us that, that it's the oxygen atom, but already having gained its electrons, so forming the oxide ion. So the oxygen over here is in group 16, forms negative two charged ions. And so we write the symbol and the charge of the oxide ion. So that's completing this step right here. We've written the symbols and the charges. Now we're going to cross down the numbers. So we take the 1 and bring the 1 down over here, and we take the 2 and bring the 2 down over here. And now we look to reduce if we can. So focus in on the numbers that you just crossed down. Is this a ratio in lowest terms? It is. As soon as, soon as you see a 1 as part of the ratio, it can't be divided by any number other than itself in order to so other than one in order to generate a lower term ratio. And so a ratio of two to one is in lowest terms, so we keep it like that. So now we're ready to write the final answer. Be careful to omit that one. So the correct and final answer here is Na2O. So I'll just box this out in green. Okay, let's try example number two, calcium chloride. Symbol, charge, cross down. Reduce if you can. So we look up calcium on the periodic table and find it right over here in group two. I don't know if you can see that. I'll move that up a little bit. So calcium over here in group two with a positive two charge. And so we write the calcium symbol with its charge. Now we're looking at chloride. So again, that IDE ending is just there because the chlorine atom has formed a negative ion. We need to write the symbol and charge of that new ion. So Cl with its negative one charge that is the chloride ion. So we've written the symbols and the charges, and now we cross down. So this two will come down over here, and the one will come down over here, and we check to see if we can reduce. Ratio of one to two is in lowest terms, and so we finish with CaCl2. There should be no spaces, no commas, and no number ones as subscripts. And so our final answer here is calcium, is CaCl2, that's for calcium chloride. Okay, so let's do a couple more examples. So here's example three and four, magnesium sulfide and aluminum nitride. So I suggest if you're understanding the steps to try this yourself, so pause the video and try it yourself and then check back with the video to correct your work. Okay, so I started with the symbols and charges of the magnesium ion and the sulfide ion. So magnesium was over here in group two with a positive two charge, and the sulfur atom becomes the sulfide ion when it gains two electrons, so there it is with a negative two charge. So I wrote the symbols and those charges, and then I crossed the numbers down. So now I see that I have two and two. So a ratio of two to two actually is not in lowest terms. I can divide both of these numbers by 2, and in doing so, 2 divided by 2 would be 1, and 2 divided by 2 would be 1. So a ratio of 2 to 2 is actually 1 to 1 in lowest terms. 
And so my final answer here is MGS. I omit the ones. Okay, try aluminum nitride. Check back with the video. Okay, so I wrote the symbols and charges for aluminum and nitride ions, crossed the numbers down, came up with 3 to 3, which if I divide both of them by the same number, I can reduce, and so I end up with a ratio of 1 to 1, so I omit the 1s, and the final answer is ALN. I haven't made the point, and I should, that every time you write the symbol of an element, the first letter is a capital, and the second letter is lowercase, and you must be consistent with that. So follow what you see for the symbols on the periodic table. Okay, so these are the simplest types of binary ionic um, compounds. I, I say that there's the simplest because when you look for the metal, you find it over here in group one or group two, and you have a nice charge up at the top to help you out. Same thing with aluminum. We found it over here and had a nice charge of positive three. Well, what if you have zinc? or silver, or copper, or nickel, or iron? What if you have metals that are in the transition metals section here? Well, it's a bit of a different story because when you go to find copper, for example, you don't see a charge written here, and you have no way to figure that out. Unlike being able to figure out that lithium in group one has one valence electron, and so it'll lose one to form the positive one ion. You really can't use your Bohr model of the atom to understand the electrons in copper, and so you're a little bit stuck here. Well, it turns out that most of the metals that are in this section have more than one possible charge, and we call those multivalent metals, or bivalent if they only have two metals. Now, there are two elements, or two metals, that you'll be required to know the charge of that do not form more than one charge. And zinc is one of those, so zinc has a positive two charge, and silver has a positive one charge. So before I move into examples with the multivalent metals, I'm going to do a couple of examples with silver and zinc. So you're going to need to remember that zinc forms a positive two charge, and silver forms a positive one charge. So let's write the formula now of zinc bromide. So follow the exact same method. Symbol, charge, cross down, reduce if you can, omit the ones in the final answer. Note that zinc has a charge of positive two. And how are you going to know that on the test? Well, you have to memorize it, that zinc forms positive two ions only. So try this question, example number five, and then check back with the video. Okay, so I wrote the charge, symbol and charge of zinc and the bromide ion from over here in group 17. Cross the numbers down, so I end up with the two over here and a one here. Ratio of one to two is in lowest terms. I omit the one and write the final answer, ZnBr2. Try silver chloride. Silver, as you can see on the periodic table, has a charge of positive one. Okay, so I filled this in here. Now your teacher, hopefully you have a, a periodic table from your teacher and or you can print one from many different sources online and you know fill in this charge here to help yourself to keep remembering that that silver ions always have a positive one charge okay so go ahead and use that that silver forms positive one charges find the charge of the chloride ion and follow your steps to write the formula of silver chloride pause the video and check back when you're done Okay, so what happens if the metal in the ionic compound comes from this transition metal section and it's not zinc or silver? That can be tricky. Well, fortunately, there's a system in place to communicate to us which charge we should be using for our crossdown method. And so we'll do a couple of examples here. You may want to take this note down here. Multivalent metals have more than one possible charge. So for example, iron could be positive two or positive three. A Roman numeral will be used to, in the actual name of the compound to indicate the charge of the metal ion. The Roman numerals that you'll be using the most commonly here will be one, two, three, and four. Okay, so those are the ones that you have to know really well. Okay, so let's look now at example seven and eight. 
They're going to be done exactly the same way as examples 1 to 6 because they are binary ionic compounds. We still have a metal and a nonmetal in both of these, so they're ionic compounds. We're going to cross down. Now, to look up iron, we'll look on the periodic table and see that iron's found, found over here. And do we know the charge? No, we don't. But we see the Roman numeral, and so that tells us the charge. So we'll go ahead and write the symbol of the iron, Fe, with that charge. The Roman numeral tells us the charge is positive 3. We look over in group 17 and find the chloride ion and its charge. And now we go ahead and cross the numbers down. So we end up with a 1 and a 3. So we go ahead and write our final answer because 1 to 3 is a ratio already in lowest terms. And so the final answer is FeCl3. So go ahead and try iron 2 chloride and then check back with the video. Okay, and so you'll see that again that I used the Roman numeral to tell me the charge on the iron. And then wrote my charge, symbol and charge for the chloride ion, crossed the numbers down, one to two is already in lowest terms, and so I finish with FeCl2. So it will be important for you to be able to recognize when the ionic compound, when the name of the ionic compound needs a Roman numeral. And so I've highlighted on this periodic table this, the, where you'll find the metals that require Roman numerals in their names. So you'll notice here that I've highlighted essentially the transition metals as well as tin and lead. So remember we wrote those charges of positive 2 and positive 4 for tin or lead. That means that any name that's any ionic compound name that is written that has tin as the metal is going to be tin 2 something, tin 2 chloride or tin 4 chloride. So you'll need to pay attention then to a Roman numeral for compounds that have tin and lead. And any of these metals here will make the general assumption that all of these are multivalent except for silver and zinc. So we already did examples with silver and zinc. You need to memorize those two charges for silver and zinc. And otherwise, you'll have a Roman numeral to tell you the charge of these multivalent metals. So we'll do two more examples just to show you something with tin and lead. So follow the cross down method and try examples 9 and 10. Remember to reduce if possible and then write your final answer. Check back with the video when you finish the answer. Okay, so tin 4 oxide. I started with the symbol of tin and the Roman numeral told me the charge on the tin. Just the same as we had with our examples including iron. And then the oxide ion, oxygen, with its negative 2 charge. Cross down the numbers, I have a ratio now of 2 to 4. So that ratio is not in lowest terms. We need to divide both of those numbers by 2 in order to reduce them to 1 to 2. And so we finish up with SNO2, omitting the 1 as the subscript. Okay, lead to fluoride, we see the symbol for lead is Pb, and that charge there of the Roman numeral is positive 2, symbol for fluoride is F, with a negative 1 charge. Cross down our numbers, we'll have a 2 there and a 1 here, and write our final answer, PbF2, again omitting the subscript of 1. Okay, so those are 10 examples of binary ionic compounds. You'll notice that the metal was always written first and always had a positive charge, and the nonmetal always came from the right side of the periodic table. Sometimes the metals needed a Roman numeral. And again, I'll remind you that the highlighted section, the transition metals, except for tin and lead, sorry, except for silver and zinc, need a Roman numeral. The other two metals that need a Roman numeral are tin and lead. And so I've reminded you with this key written right here. Okay, so the last type, a uh, few examples we'll do with ionic compounds involve polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ionic compounds are not binary, meaning there's not just two elements in these compounds. They contain, as I show you here, many atom ions. 
And so this is the list of polyatomic ions that is provided for you on the back of your periodic table. You'll notice, for example, nitrate, NO3, negative 1. So this is a negatively charged an anion, an, an anion, and there's one nitrogen and three oxygens. So actually a cluster of four atoms together form this nitrate ion. These compounds are still ionic. You're still going to see a cation first and then a negative ion. Most of the time, that cation will be a metal, just like we saw with the binary compounds. But very occasionally, you may see the ammonium ion. So notice that the ammonium ion is a positive ion, a cation. The anion, instead of being a single nonmetal ion, a single atom ion, you'll find that you get one of these negative ions from the polyatomic ion list. So what's really new here is that when you use a polyatomic ion, make sure you put brackets around the atoms in that cluster. We're still going to use the crosstown method. Okay, so to show you how this works, we'll do sodium carbonate. So just like before, symbols with charges. So we find the sodium symbol on the periodic table in group 1 and write the charge of positive 1. And then we see this carbonate name. And so we look on the polyatomic ion list and find the carbonate ion, CO3, negative 2. So I'm suggesting that you use brackets around the CO3, put the charge outside, and now continue with your crosstown method. So the 1 goes down outside the brackets, the 2 goes down outside the brackets right after the metal, and we check those numbers that are outside the brackets to see if they can be reduced. So ratio of 2 to 1 is in lowest terms, and so we finish with Na2. Now, just before we omitted the one for the subscripts, same thing. We're going to omit the one that's outside the brackets, which means in the final answer here that we do not need the brackets. And so the final answer is Na2CO3. So we're going to omit the one that comes after the brackets, and therefore we will omit the brackets. That's the only time you take the brackets off for the final answer. If the number was a one outside of the brackets, at the end, then you can remove the brackets. So let's try aluminum hydroxide. You'll see hydroxide at the bottom of your negative one column here on the polyatomic ion list. So you try the question, go right to the end, and then check back with the video. Okay, so you'll see that the aluminum with its charge was written first, and then the hydroxide ion, again, it's a polyatomic ion, so we use brackets, put our negative one charge outside. Cross down the numbers, I see a one after the aluminum, and three now after the OH. So the only time we omit the brackets in the final answer is if this number right here, this subscript, is a one. So notice that it's not one, it's three, and therefore I have to keep the three and keep the brackets. I omitted the one that was coming after the aluminum, just like before. That's, those brackets are very important. Without the brackets, this answer would be incorrect. We're indicating that there are three hydroxide ions, three O's and three H's. Without the brackets, you haven't included the oxygen with the three. Okay, so follow the same rules as before and the cross-down method and complete examples 13 and 14. Okay, so you'll see for copper 2 sulfate, I wrote the symbol of the copper, letting the Roman numeral tell me the charge. There's a positive 2. Sulfate came from the polyatomic ion list. I've spelt it with F. I can see on your list it's pH. It's just a difference between the British and American spelling, either is acceptable. And I cross my numbers down, twos come down outside the brackets. Can those twos reduce? Yes, they can. Divide each by two and we end up with one to one. So do I write the one that comes after the copper? No, just like before, I omit ones in the final answer. Now, do I need the brackets? Well, there's a one right after the brackets. So when we omit, you'll recall we did it up here, when we omit the one after the brackets, we also omit the brackets. And so the final answer is CUSO4. Sodium bicarbonate, we wrote charges, brackets around the bicarbonate, cross the ones down, omit the ones, and omit the brackets. 
Okay, so this video has taught you how to write formulas for ionic compounds, binary ionic compounds with or without multivalent metals and polyatomic ionic compounds. I have not gone through the steps of actually naming, so given the formula, write the name. You may be able to figure that out just from these examples, but I'll do a separate shorter video that just reviews how to do that. 